Well, hello. Welcome to Around the Galaxy, the Star Wars fan talk show. I am your host, Pete Fletcher. Thank you so much for joining us. If you are with us during this live stream, that means that you are a patron, and I can't thank you enough for being a part of our our group, our family, our Star Wars conversation. Uh, tonight, I am excited to bring you a conversation with Mr. Mark Altman. Mark is a writer, producer, and actor. He was one of the writers on the uh, romantic comedy Free Enterprise. Uh, he was more than just a writer. He was a producer and creator of of that and uh, he's written many behind the scenes books and historical records about the Star Trek franchise, um, as well as written Star Trek uh comic books for DC and Malibu. And so, you might be asking yourself, why, why a Star Trek guy? Well, two reasons. First of all, he was uh responsible for the uh the very popular sci fi universe magazine back in the mid and late 90s, and he has a book coming out in mid July. Uh, called uh, Secrets of the Force, and it is the unauthorized oral biography, uh, or oral history of the Star Wars franchise. So I am honored and ple pleased to bring you Mr. Mark Altman. Mark, how are you? Good, Pete. Yeah, here's the, here's the book right here. So, there it is. Uh, it's, uh... There you go. In case people are doubting my uh, Star Wars bona fides, <laughs> they, they want to make sure that I'm not some uh, Trek guy masquerading as a Star Wars fan. Yeah, you know, they, they just sneak in here. It's what happens. I understand. <laughs> so, so, Mark, let's settle it. Star Trek or Star Wars, what's better? No, I'm just... Uh... <laughs> well, you know, look, that's kind of like saying who's your favorite James Bond. Is it Sean Connery or, you know, right. Roger Moore or George Lazenby or... You know, Daniel Craig, you know, and, and I always say it's, uh, you know, growing up in New York, it's like Mets or Yankees or, you know, it's just, it, 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 I, you know, to me, it's like, I love them both. Yeah. I love both my children equally. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, it's never been like, oh, which is better? And, you know, it depends on your mood, too. If you're looking yeah. for a cerebral morality tale, then chances are it's Star Trek. If you're looking for some kick-ass, you know, action and, 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 uh, deep with deep philosophical underpinnings and it's star wars you know yeah absolutely well and both franchises have now been around for multiple generations it's hard to believe um well first of all if i have to then admit that i'm 50 but looking through and recognizing that both star trek and star wars are now multi-generational where do you think they're most alike and where do you think they're most different as franchises go Oh, that's, you know, like, that's an interesting question. Look, I, I, I think uh, one of the people who said it best, that there was the, you know, I was there for that 10th anniversary convention of Star Wars uh, in Los Angeles. It was my first time I ever came out to Los Angeles. And, you know, where George Lucas and Gene Roddenberry met for the first, mm. I think, last time. And, you know, they both talked about how they admired each other's galaxies. And, uh, uh, and, 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 and uh, but they're very, they're very, very different, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think that, uh, uh, you know, certainly with, with, you know, Star Wars, uh, you know, the reason that we love Star Trek and we love Star Wars is there's such a rich tapestry to mm. the canon. You know, I think one of the great things, you know, a lot of people say, oh, maybe they didn't like the prequels, but that Clone Wars elevated them in their mind because Clone Wars is so good. So, you know, the universe of Star Wars is so rich, all these civilizations, all these races. You know, certainly legend uh, expanded, the legends expanded on it. And but, you know, what they've done, you know, in the last 10 years in terms of television, in terms of animation, in terms of, you know, Mandalorian and stuff has just enriched the universe. And I think what Star Trek gets it, is at its best. It's when it's it, it also is plumbing that mythology of, you know, the, the different galactic races and the planets. And it, and it respects its canon and doesn't mm -hmm. try and revent, you know, re reinvent itself. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. And I think that's been one of the interesting challenges for Star Wars and Star Trek had to fight it for many years because they were sort of, you know, with uh, they, you know, they had novels that just went off in all kinds of different directions back back before uh, canon was was really a, a, a thing in, in that universe. But do you still see, you know, I, I having been a Star Wars fan my whole life, a bit of a Star Trek fan, but not as 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 deeply. There was a point in time. So, just a, a real, real quick uh, setup here. So, back in in the uh, in the nineties, this is this is our sort of two degrees of separation, I suppose. So, um, back in the nineties, my father had a game called the Science Fiction and Horror Trivia Game, the Amazing Science Fiction and Horror Trivia Game, and you actually emceed a live version of the game. And and um, I and, did. <laughs> yeah, actually, it's it's funny. My I so my dad, who's actually still a big fan of of my show and my writing, he he sent me a picture. This is you actually reading. Oh these. my god! It was there in was Maryland it. in the late nineties. Oh my god! Right, that's right, in Atlantic City. 
<laughs> yeah, that was the I was the reason I think I look so um yeah, you know what? I don't know if I want to share this story, but <laughs> I, I, I remember getting off the plane and my girlfriend at the time called me and was telling me some information that was potentially very disquieting, which mm. turned out not to be true. But she Good. was so neurotic and crazed about what what was happening. And it totally screwed up that whole weekend for me. <laughs> and it was like, and then I'm like, I have to go. And then it was like, she kept calling. And this, thank God, this is before cell phones. So like, I'll have to call you back. But I, I, that whole weekend was totally screwed up for me. And it was my first time, even though I'm a New Yorker in Atlantic City. And right. um, and it was, a, it was a great convention. And I had a really fun time. But I remember the whole thing was overshadowed by this drama with my ex-girlfriend. Uh, oh, that's, that's uh, the worst. And, and you're right. Thank and, you. and what's scary is 30 years later, and I still remember that. Yeah. I, and a photo shows up in the least uh, likely opportunity. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow, man. That is a scary looking photo. <laughs> but it's um, funny be, be, because, you know, at that time, I mean, the, the way my my uh, the, the game, the Amazing Science Fiction Hard Trivia game worked was they had Star Wars and Star Trek questions together. And I had written all the Star Wars questions but there was kind of a competition at the time between star wars and star trek fans do you see that still or do you think it's it's kind of uh both fandoms have kind of grown in their own directions oh, or yeah, you know it, it, there is i mean it's ridiculous because i know you know i have a, a very oh excuse me i'm gonna sneeze <laughs> i have a very popular star trek podcast that i co-host called inglorious trek experts Mm -hmm. And, you know, occasionally we'll dip into Star Wars. Like we had Henry Gilroy on to talk about Clone Wars, basically because, you know, I freaking love Clone Wars. So, you know, <laughs> I find any excuses to, to do that stuff. And, you know, uh, we got such pushback. This is a Star Trek podcast, not a Star <laughs> Wars podcast. And, you know, it, it, it's uh, it's really annoying because I feel like, you know, I try to, like, deal with whatever I find interesting whatever I like, you know, and like we did an episode with Aaron Gray on Buck Rogers. And I found the thinnest sliver uh, of Star Trek to hang it on that she auditioned <laughs> once for Janeway and Voyager. Okay. So, um, you know, it, it's amazing to me when people do that. And even like, you know, on the Twitter feed uh, or something for Inglorious Trek Experts or my personal thing, it's like, you know, we mentioned something about Star Wars and it's like, hey, you know, but you're a Star Trek. It's like, get mm -hmm. out. You know, it's like, talk about, you know, stay in your lane kind of nonsense. It's like, yeah ridiculous um you... oh go ahead i'm sorry, sorry go ahead. well i was gonna say i mean it's like you know it's what we said at the beginning i love them both for different reasons mm -hmm. that, you know and and you know i've been a star wars fan since 77 you know i mean I, I i talk about it in the introduction to the book i mean i uh had first heard about it i think it was in starlog number seven uh mm -hmm. or maybe before that but i remember i'll never forget you know when starlog had a star wars on the cover and it consisted of a one page article with two Ralph Macquarie paintings. So, like that was their coverage. And uh, I was so frustrated because I was desperate for anything about Star Wars. And I kept telling my parents, it's like, I, I, I have to see this movie. I mean, this movie is going to be amazing. It looks incredible. I, you know, I, I have to see it. And, um, you know, that back then, wide releases weren't really that wide. It wasn't that, you know, it was only playing a couple of theaters. I don't even think it was playing in Brooklyn yet. So, one day, you know, my parents say, oh, we're going out to New Jersey. It was like, might as well have been, uh, you know, Saskatchewan. And uh, we're, we're, uh, we're driving, we're driving. We passed the Paramus Park Mall. And there on the marquee was the other side of Midnight and Star Wars. I'm like, look, Star Wars, buddy, we got to go. They say, oh, we're not going to that. And, and we go and we go to this Farrell's Ice Cream Parlor. And we had a great time, great ice cream and everything. And we start driving back. And suddenly I notice, wait a second, we're pulling into the parking lot. And I'm like, what's going on? They said, what do you think? We're, we're out here. We didn't go here to come out for ice cream. We're going to see Star Wars. I'm like, oh, I was like the happiest day of my life. So, and I mean, I, I, I say, and this is true in the book, I could literally show you where the parking spot was, you know, 40 years later where we parked. And, and um, you know, and then we went in. I had the same experience everybody did. You know, the chance of uh, going over Tatooine, you're thinking this is the coolest ship ever. And then all of a sudden the Star Destroyer is like, oh, my God, this is the coolest thing ever. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, I mean, so I'm a huge Star Wars fan. And, and um, you know, that's why this whole idea of, oh, Star Trek versus Star Wars, I think there's a false equivalency. They're both great in completely different ways. And it used to be, you say, Star Trek was essentially a TV franchise that really bumbled around with movies to, the, to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a movie franchise. It didn't work best as a movie. And then Star Wars was really a movie franchise that bumbled around on TV. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with the, the Endor movies, you know, the Ewok movies, <laughs> and, yeah. you know, the holiday special. But now all that's been blown up. 
because um, obviously, well, less so for Star Trek. Star Trek's still barely at the at TV, but <laughs> um, but with you know Star Wars, the best Star Wars is really being done for TV now. So uh, it, it's kind of not true anymore. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting because I think you said, I have a quote here from you. I think in 1999, you said, when Deep Space Nine and Next Generation were on the IR simultaneously, that was the beginning of what some would say was overkill, beating it into submission, exploiting the crown jewel. Would you say that Star Wars might be doing that right now? I mean, there's Star Wars everywhere. And as a, as a lifelong fan, I love it. But do you feel like is Star Wars sort of on that edge of potentially flooding the market? <sighs> You know, I, I, there's the potential, but I, I always think there's plenty of room as long as it's good. Mm. And, you know, I think one of the problems, unfortunately, with the sequels was it was this whole notion of we want to attract a new audience. And I don't think Star Wars has been particularly good in terms of attracting, uh, you know, a lot of young people to the franchise the way we got excited about it. Right. I think what Star Wars has been good is keeping us around, you know, right. and keeping us excited about Star Wars. But, you know, even if, you know, you, you, you sort of my market research is like, I'll look on Halloween, how many mm -hmm. people are dressed up in Star Wars costumes. And when Force Awakens came, you know, there was like this kind of resurgence. But by mm -hmm. the time you get to Rise of Skywalker, there weren't that many people dressing up as Star Wars in that age bracket. You know, That's I mean, true. my son is a huge Star Wars fan, but um, I find that a lot of people he goes to school with, is, you know, his peers aren't, you know, he, he he's desperate to find more people you know, who is uh, crazed about Star Wars is he, yeah, he is. But, you know, to me, it's like you look right now and like with Mandalorian and Bad Bad Batch, which I, I really love, but I love Men on a Mission movies. So I love like right. Dirty Dozen and Magnus and Seven. So I'm a sucker for the Bad Batch. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I think that, um, you know, there's definitely a danger. Um, you know, Star Trek's going through that, like how many shows, but I think it's like, how many good shows can you have? Probably... Right. Not enough, you know. It's like just look at Star Wars. I uh, Marvel. There's no Marvel fatigue. You know, they do it's WandaVision, great. Falcon of Snowman, uh, a Loki now, and nobody's saying there's too many Mar uh, Marvel TV shows. They say give me more, make my right. Marvel right. And yeah. and I think it's the same thing with Star Wars. As long as they keep delivering on the promise, you know, yeah. it, it'll help. I just think I'm, you know, the 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 sequels ultimately were very polarizing, and so you know, a lot of people have a chip on their shoulder now about about Star Wars. But some of the best Star Wars you know around has been done the last 10 years you know rogue one is uh, phenomenal and mm -hmm. you know i think that the, the tv series you know obviously that last season of clone wars was was great and um you know so there's a lot of great star wars there's no sense for me of like fatigue or that you know um the franchise is, is faltering you yeah. know whereas you could make that argument with star trek yeah well and it's interesting because i as, as i said i i follow Star Trek, but very peripherally, very much uh, on the edge, just because it's, you know, it's always been a part of, of my life in one way or another, but not, not, but it is interesting to watch Star Trek try to kind of come back into that. And to your point, it's, they're, they're trying to find that, that pickup again, but I don't know. I, my sense is that uh, these Star Trek specifically seems to come and go. And when it comes back, it comes back strong and then it goes away for a while. Then it comes back. Yeah. Uh, uh, but maybe yeah. that's, yeah. The biggest mistake that people make is, I think, comparing Star Trek to Star Wars. There's a sense, you know, even going back to when Star Trek, the motion picture was put into production, you know, Paramount was going to do a TV series of Star Trek. And they said, what? Are, and the Star Wars opens and they said, what do we have that's like mm -hmm. Star Wars? And they said, oh, Star Trek is star in the title. Right. <laughs> but Star Trek is not Star Wars. Right. You know, so you have the first Happy Meal from McDonald's as a Star Trek Happy Meal. But, you know, it's not. Star Wars. Everyone thinks mm -hmm. it's, oh, this is going to be on par with Star Wars. And the toys bomb, right? And then the second Happy Meal is Burger <laughs> King. By the time you get to Star Trek 3, it's Taco Bell. It shows you how mediocre, you know, Star Trek is not Star Wars. Star Wars is is for everyone, mm -hmm. right? Star Wars is a huge franchise. And, and, you know, Star Trek, while stuff like Kirk, Spock, and McCoy are sort of iconic and people – you know, no matter even people who don't watch the show know who they are. They know what warp speed means. It's mm -hmm. entered the vernacular. Star Trek as a franchise is not nearly, you know, and I would argue this even if I was saying the Star Trek is the better franchise. Mm -hmm. um, you can't argue it's the more successful franchise. It's not at the box office, mm -hmm. and it's certainly not uh, in terms of uh, uh, um, and, and internationally. It's never performed that well. You know, right. it's a it's a primarily U.S. phenomena. Um, more so than Star Wars, which is more of a global brand. 
Um, I mean, you know, just compare the success. I mean, the Star Trek the toys and merchandise have always been niche products where right. Star Wars is, you know, the most successful IP toy line, you know, of all time. Right. Yeah. I was going to say, as you were going through that, that list, it, my, my thinking was initially that you don't see Star Trek action figures and Star Wars is, is a toy creating and collectible creating machine at, at all levels where I feel like Star Trek is very specific in the types of things that, that are available for Star Trek collectors to, well, I, to get. And there's a reason that basically the failure of the Star Trek toy line basically put me go out of business, but also that every movie, it's a different to master toy licensee where Star Wars, you basically have Kenner and then Kenner gets sold to Hasbro and then Hasbro mm -hmm. does the toys until today. Whereas, you know, with Star Trek, it's always someone different because they're never successful. And whoever's <laughs> going to do it thinks, oh, we're going to be the people that make Star Trek successful because they really think it's on par with Star Wars. And it's it's not. It, the kids don't aren't into Star Trek. They've never mm -hmm. been, in the, you know, uh, uh, and they don't play with the stuff as much. So it's much more a high end collectible market only for Star Trek, where people want to spend a couple of grand on an enterprise, you know, as opposed to, you know, and, and the same way that people spend hundreds of dollars on hot toys for Star Wars. Right. Um, but, you know, it's not like something where you just go, if there were still a Toys R Us, you mm -hmm. go, oh, I'm going to buy a bunch of Star Trek action figures. I mean, that 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 doesn't exist anymore. Right, right. So, so tell us a, a little bit about uh, the book, the uh, the the uh, the Star Wars, the, uh, the sorry, the uh, the Secrets of the Force. Secrets book. of the Force. Yes. Yeah. Well, we, um, you know, we've done a series of very successful uh, books, um, oral histories, and uh, starting with uh, Fifty Year Mission in um, uh, for the fiftieth anniversary of Star Trek, and that was a two volume book. It was sold as a one volume book. And um, it was so, our manuscript was so long, we told our editor, we said, you know, this needs to be two volumes. This needs <laughs> to be two. And, and he said, I'll be the judge of that. And we sent him the manuscript and we literally got an email that next Monday and said, it's two books, which was very gratifying because right. we would have had it. And, and, you know, the books were uh, hugely successful. I mean, you know, bestsellers and everything. And that was great. And that was gratifying. We put a lot of work into it. So then, you know, we did uh, we did a Galactica book. We did a James Bond book for them, same oral history format. Um, and, and you know, all, all of them did did well. But um, it's funny, but Star Wars was the first time they came to us and said, um, we want to see, would you be interested? Uh, or, you know, and I said, you know, Ed immediately said yes. And I, <laughs> like uh, Michael Corleone in Godfather 3, keep trying to get out, but they pull me back in uh, <laughs> because – I just don't have the time, you know, I'm producing a TV series. I have my show on the CW, Pandora. Um, you know, uh, we're doing this documentary in 1982, um, Greatest Geek Year Ever, which is mm -hmm. actually funding on Kickstarter right now. So I'm always got a million things going. So, the, you know, these books are very time consuming and they're a ton of work. And, you know, we got this deal right before I had to go shoot the second season of Pandora in Europe. And I was, you know, and uh, Ed, Ed was like, we got to do this. And I'm like, God, I love Star Wars. I, I hmm. and so it's like, so it was like after I thought the Bond book was going to be my last book, and I'm just like, okay, I'll do Star Wars because <laughs> it's Star Wars. And so we ended up doing the book, and you know, we did have to, you know, we didn't have a ton of time um, to to and uh, and then it was complicated by the pandemic. So a lot of the people we would interview in person and um, stuff, but uh, uh, we wrote it, and it was really really gratifying because you know we tried to do what we do in all our books is sort of explore some of the nooks and crannies of the universe that, that tend to get um, overlooked in other books. Like for instance, when we did Galactica, you know, I think I wrote the greatest chapter in the history of chapters on Galactica 1980 because mm -hmm. I knew no one else would ever cover it. This would be the last <laughs> book. So, you know what? And I was funny because we wrote our, our, the first, we wrote that chapter and I read it back and I'm just like, this isn't good enough. We can do it better because no one's ever going to cover the show again. And it's like, we have to, we, we owe it to posterity. So I wrote it, and it's hysterical, and I love that chapter. I love that whole book, but I love that chapter. So it was the same thing with this, with the holiday special. It's like we got to really, you know, we can't do the perfunctory coverage of the holiday special. The author, ridiculous, it's awful, everybody hates it, life day, ha. Ah. So, you know, we really tried to go and do a deeper dive into why that thing is such a, a, a disaster. And, you know, I think it's a really fascinating story. And, and you know, I think, you know, this was challenging because – more so than any other book, there's such a vice-like grip, 
mo- mo- almost like the empire around this franchise that, you know, sometimes access can be very challenging. Mm-hmm. And we weren't used to that because we usually got, you know, um, almost, you know, 95% cooperation. And I'd have to say on this book, it was much more difficult to get people to cooperate. Also, because people are so used to monetizing Star Trek, Star Wars, mm-hmm. that they always have their hand. They, oh, you're not going to pay me for an interview? No, I was just a journalist. You know, you're not going to pay. Well, I'm not, you know, I'm not interested. So that was challenging. But at the end of the day, I think we wrote a really great book about Star Wars, particularly one that examines the whole franchise in one volume. Because people are going to say, oh, they didn't go into enough detail about this or they didn't do that. I mean, it just wasn't feasible because. It, you know, it's still a very hefty tome yeah. and, you know, we, we, we just, it had to be, you know, with very small print uh, and, and uh, you know, but I mean, we cover it all from the inception through, um, you know, through the Mandalorian. So um, I'm very, you know, I'm very happy how it came out. I'd really like to do. It's funny. I mean, I keep saying I'm done, but then I'm like, oh, but maybe the next one. <laughs> yeah. I was going to um, say, it sounds like you're dragging yourself back in. Mark. <laughs> I'd really like to do an oral history of the Clone Wars because I mm. do feel it gets a little bit of short shrift in the book by necessity. And I think there's so much to talk about with the Clone Wars and maybe a book that was Clone Wars, Rebels, and Bad Batch. Mm. Um, uh, but, um, you know, we'll see. I mean, it depends how this book sells. I, I, I mean, so far... I mean, it was, I was already a bestseller in Kindle. It hasn't even come out yet. So hmm. I'm, I'm somewhat encouraged. Plus, St. Martin's, uh, who published our first book, the, the the Star Trek book, does a really good job marketing and promoting. So I'm yeah. very I'm very optimistic that this book will be a big seller because these guys, we, 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 were, we were very impressed with them on Star Trek. And they didn't do our next couple of books. And and then they're back for this one. And so I'm, I'm very hopeful that, you know, this will be, you know, of of the success of the Star Trek book, if not more so. I, it's interesting because there's always uh, uh, over the last eight to ten years, there's such a hunger for anything Star Wars that comes out. So that certainly certainly helps you. But it's also Star Wars is one of the most well documented from a making of perspective, right? As far as the, yes. the 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 films, you know, the the technical aspect and things like that. What are some of the things that you discovered while creating this book that that surprised you a little bit, or that you think people will be most interested in? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question because I do think that there's a lot in here you haven't seen before. But you're absolutely right. I mean, when you have those beautiful uh, Charlie Lippincott coffee table yeah. books, um, how do you compete with that? Those are beautiful uh, books with you know he has access to the entire. Lucasfilm archives. Mm-hmm. I think what you have are these books that go into that level, you know, with the photos and everything like that. Is that they are, you know, m- products of the myth. So right. they are repeating the myth making, and not that in any way we wanted to dispel the myth or be a gossipy tome. I mean, there have been plenty of books written, you know, which were the equivalent of the People versus George <laughs> Lucas. Right. Um, and I forget what that book was, you know, about 10, 15 years ago which was a uh, um, really, you know, uh, you know, attempted to just tear the whole thing apart. And obviously, you know, th- there's a lot of questions as to, you know, how important were Gary Kurtz and Marshall Lucas to why Star Wars worked, you know, and, and, and there's a feeling they don't get enough credit. So, I mean, we go into some of that stuff, but it's not about tearing down George Lucas in any way, which a lot of these, you know, non Lucasfilm slash Disney books have done. Right. Um, but I think it is is about trying to be honest. One of the things I like about the oral histories is you can have multiple opinions and you don't have to side with any one of them. It's like Rashomon. Hmm. So hmm. three people can say three different things and it can be completely contradictory. And it's up to the reader to really say, I believe him or I don't believe them or the truth lies somewhere in between, hmm. which is one of the reasons we really embrace the oral history format. And it's funny because sometimes you have people who say, oh, they're just uh, putting a bunch of quotes together. And, you know, you don't realize that, um, you know, you're doing all the research, you're doing all the interviews, you're then creating a structure by which the story is told. I always compare it to like the world's greatest dinner party where you're (laughs) hanging out with 500 people and you're progressively getting them drunker and drunker through the meal. So they're getting more and more honest. And you have to create this narrative, you know, that takes you from the beginning to the end, which is a huge part of writing these books. Um, And, you know, I discovered the oral history format um prior to doing the star trek book where it was um i actually said no a couple of times to doing the star trek book and then i read this book called i want my mtv which was an Mm -hmm. oral history of mtv and it was really interesting 
and it was heartfelt and it was funny and it was bawdy and it was all, I'm like, this is a great way to tell this story. And then I read right after that live from New York, the Saturday Night Live oral history. Mm. And I called my co-writer and I said, I know how you've been trying to get me to do this book on Star Trek. I said, I think I know a way to do it. He said, I thought you don't want to do it. I said, I don't. But if we do as an oral history and we can get a good deal for it, that I'd be interested in. And yeah. so, of course, he used that to go to our agent and said, okay, Mark's in, you know, if you can get a good deal. Like she sold it the next day. Mm. And, and then I was like, okay, now I'm stuck writing a book. And then I was like, <laughs> I want to write the best book ever written about Star Trek. And I feel like, you know, with the possible exception of Gene Roddenberry and Stephen Whitfield's making of Star Trek, we did. Um, with Star Wars, it, you're right. It was a challenge because there's so many great books about Star Wars. Yeah. I think that this belongs, you know, on the same shelf. Mm. Um, but by na the nature of the fact that we're not focusing on any one aspect, because you could do a book of this size just about Star Wars or just yeah. about Empire or just mm. about the Clone Wars, you know, or just about one of the prequels. I wouldn't write it. But, <laughs> uh, you know, you could, you, or the sequels or whatever. And, uh, and, and, um, but, um, but, you know, we did it all. And so um, it was creating a narrative that sort of took you through all of this in a way that was compelling and also wasn't like, oh, this is like the greatest hits or the cliff notes of Star Wars. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, you know, I haven't heard this stuff before. So that's, that's really, you know, what we try to do. And it's like I said, we, the holiday special, you know, certainly the evolution of the Empire Strikes Back scripts and how dramatically that evolved, um, mm. you know, and... Um, I think, uh, you know, just a lot of stuff that hopefully people haven't, you know, haven't heard before. And, and you know, going into more detail about the prequels. And, you know, um, I know a lot of people love those movies and adore those movies. So, you know, we're not putting our opinions into it. It's really right. about letting the creators and the people involved tell this, tell the stories. But I, I think it's also a less, um, you know, again, it's a less Lucasfilm filtered version of the prequels which right. I think makes it a more interesting story without bashing on them because yeah. we don't. Yeah. I, you know, and I think that you're, you're going to have an, a, another book in, in several years to kind of go back and look at what happened with the sequels. Do you go much into the sequels? Cause there's this, uh, you know, you, you see it online. I don't know how, how much you, you probably follow all kinds of different fandoms online, but there's this belief that the sequels were a little bit messy in the way that they came together. Do you feel do you have, uh, do you have any insight on the sequels in the book as well? Or Yeah. I mean, we obviously we go in a, a lot into um, uh, certainly uh, the duel of the fates situation with Colin. Oh, great. Um, and I think that stuff's, you know, obviously really interesting. I will say this. It's, it's um, I think the least successful part of our Star Trek book was when we went to the JJ films, I mm -hmm. think partially because they were too recent. Right. And so you still had people who were towing the party line and less willing to be honest. And, mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think our book, if I be completely honest, suffers a little of that with the sequels, sure. um, yeah. you know, that it's harder to do, you know, even now JJ's first saying, yeah, maybe we should have a plan going yeah. in for all three movies as though mm -hmm. this is some kind of revelation. <laughs> um, but, you know, look, the, the, those movies are very divisive. I mean, you know, a lot of people absolutely, you know, adored uh, um, Force Awakens and now in retrospect, you know, completely slagging on it and their opinions have, have evolved. Um, you know, I happen to be one of those people who thinks that Last Jedi is is great um, mm -hmm. uh, with with caveats. Sure. Uh, you know, with, with with some big caveats. Obviously, the slow motion chase uh, mm -hmm. through hyperspace, um, uh, you know, is is problematic. And then, of course, uh, you know, anything on on Macau, Macau, what what the hell on on um, uh, Canto Bite? Uh, on Canto Bite, yes. You know, the Canto Bite <laughs> stuff is like another movie, but mm -hmm. it also has some of the great scenes in any star wars movie cinematography is gorgeous i'm a big fan of ryan johnson there's a lot i love about it i also love the message that anyone can you know become uh, you know a, a you know the revolutionary and you know that you know this kid who's pushing a broom and could end up becoming the next you know luke skywalker of course that was something that never gets followed up on sure. um you know and then rises rise skywalker um you know so look we go into the we go into these movies and i think in, a, in an interesting way and people are going to learn a, a lot that probably they didn't know about them, but you know, it definitely suffers from this is the last couple of years. I mean, it's, I, I find it with all the books. It's the same thing with Saturday Live. It's like when you get to the, 
the more recent seasons, it's not as interesting without the hi- hindsight and without people willing to be um, uh, as candid and as honest. Um, you know, because what you find is like there a lot of the crew um, mm-hmm. is going. You know, it's like Marvel; they're going from movie to movie, to movie. So the Star Wars people they don't want to burn bridges. Right. So you know, they're either not going to talk to you or they're going to give you pre- sound bites rather mm-hmm. than their you know, honest, uh, honest situation. So that that's always challenging. And that's why I feel like, you know, it's always the older stuff that is, is better, you know, is, is better in these books. Um, um, you know, there are exceptions, but, uh, but yeah, uh, you know, but we, it's, it's all in there, you know, everything's in mm-hmm. there. And, um, you know, I think if somebody went back and did something on the sequels 10 years from now, I mean, you see how the opinions on these movies have evolved in real time. Yeah. I mean, go back and look at the response to Force Awakens. There were some people who were saying, oh, my God, it is Star Wars greatest hits. But mm-hmm. the, largely the reaction was extremely positive at the time. Yep. You know, now people are like, oh, it's Star Wars greatest hits done badly. You know, so it's like, yep. it, it, you know, and people are done complete 180s. I mean, even with Rise of Skywalker in the two years since it came out, you know, there were a lot of people like, this is more like it was like people. And then now they're like, oh, that movie's terrible. Mm-hmm. But, you know, and, and but, it's so interesting to see how the opinions evolve. Yeah, and I th- I see it. You know, I speak to to people every week from different parts of the fandom, and I see it with the prequels. And I'm I'm the first to admit that when I first saw, that, you know, I was I was at the premiere of Phantom Menace and walked out of that and wasn't sure what I saw. But now I look back, and they've are they they're not my favorite star Wars, but I still enjoy them, but I enjoy them differently because it's 20 years later, right? The films evolve, what they mean to the story evolves. And I, I imagine if you spoke to the people who worked on that versus sequels, as you were just saying, you're going to get a different story because now they're on to working on other things and different organizations and things like that. Yeah. Um, and you were, you were saying we, we talked a little bit before about how and the, the phrase we used was was divisive and the, the sequels are, are a bit divisive and the Internet has changed the way people talk about films and the way they interact with creators. I mean, for example, uh, I mean, so I, I want to go down a little bit of a road here because you you ran uh, sci fi universe, which was from what 94 to 97, which was you know, sort of edgy conversation before the internet, right? I mean, you had, I, I, there was a, a cover, you know, 50 reasons why we hate Return of the Jedi, but we love Star Wars. Those are the kind of things. Yeah, you, yeah. you were, you know, hey man, you were you were ahead of your time with that kind of stuff. No, no, we, look, I, we were, and I, I've talked about this in the past, which is the idea that, you know, the internet didn't exist so, and everything was very kiss-ass at the time. Mm-hmm. So we were an antidote for the more anodyne kind of sci-fi magazines, specifically Starlog and, and a lot of these you know, kind of things. Um, and, and it, you know, it, it pissed off a lot of people, but mm-hmm. we were kind of the end fit terribles of that era <laughs> in, in that we would really, you know, call it like we saw it, the stuff we loved, we would talk about how passionately we loved it stuff. We didn't, you know, and sometimes it was tough love like mm-hmm. that 50 years, uh, uh, 50 reasons we hate return of the Jedi, but love yep. star Wars. Um, and, um, but you know, it's interesting because with the internet, I would never do a magazine like that again because mm. I think the hate, you know, hate leads to anger, anger leads, <laughs> leads to suffering. And I think that, you know, I think that when we were the only ones in town, it was important to have a critical voice. But now all that exists yes. is like a critical voice. And most of them don't have the critical acumen to back it up. So, I, you know, I may, you know, now would never do a magazine like that. I, and, and in fact, we make a big point in our Star Trek podcast in glorious Trek experts um, to only celebrate what we love. And mm-hmm. we don't talk about what we hate about Star Trek. Right. You know, we, we really just talk about the things that we really like. And, you know, we leave it to other people because, you know, whatever we dislike is probably somebody's favorite show, yep. you know, and, yep. and, and maybe the things we love are, are somebody's least favorite shows, but yep. that's, you know, but we're, we're not going to talk about all the negativity. We want to embrace the positive because it's, you know, the Twitter and everything is such a cesspool of mm-hmm. hate. You yeah. know, and, um, you know, and it, and the thing, you know, even the people that didn't like Last Jedi, it got so personal against R- Ryan Johnson. You right. know, you read some of the negativity around Kathleen, uh, Kathleen Kennedy. I mean, people forget she produced their childhood. That she's <laughs> responsible for some of the greatest right. movies of all time. And yet, you know, they, 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 you know, everything they dislike about these franchises, they blame her, you know, and, and it's, 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 it's incredibly unfair and it's, it's borderline misogynistic. And, um, 
you know, it's, it's, it's kind of ridiculous. And I'm like, you can be critical without being spiteful and without being hateful. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because you're entitled to like what you like and not like what you like. But, you know, it's also the whole idea of like, oh, well, you're an ass, you're an idiot. You know, people call it gatekeeping, which I think is bullshit. It's <laughs> kind of like, I'm like, you can say you hate something, right. but it doesn't mean that the person who likes it is wrong. It's just right. like, let them like what they like. And you can argue about it. There was a time where like, it was healthy to argue about stuff. Right. You know, it's like I, when Jedi came out, I mean, I remember it's like there are people who loved it, and you know, people who loved the Ewoks, and people didn't like the Ewoks, and you can argue about it, and you still there was no animosity, there was no bitterness about it. That was part of the fun of being a fan, right? You know, you can have different opinions. You know, it's like Logan's Run is great, no, Logan's Run sucks. You know, and <laughs> and now it's so like you have to take sides. It's it's much like how the country has become so polarized. Yeah. It's the same thing in, in fandom, and it's unfortunate because you lose out on you know conversations that will potentially elevate the critical discourse and you know it's all or nothing it's like you know we said about jedi uh, last jedi you know how yeah the things about it that i think are crazy ridiculous and stupid right. but overall i really enjoy the movie for for so many other reasons and yep. and uh you know and i could still look at look at jedi i think is a mess but hmm. there are things about it i love you know right. like the emperor and the throne room scene you know and 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 uh you, you know so i could still really enjoy jedi while not liking certain things about, sure. you know, about that movie. Well, and that, that's a really important thing. And, and you, you, you nailed something that I've been trying to, to find the right way to say, and you did a great job with it, is that you can't, it, the, the ability to have that conversation is now gone. Like, for example, I mean, I, I run a Star Wars podcast. I've been doing this for a couple of years. I have people who, who I engage with regularly. I had real problems with the rise of Skywalker, real problems with it. Um, but the challenge is, to talk about it in a critical way is very difficult because immediately people listening to the show right now might say, Oh, well, he didn't like last year, uh, which rise Skywalker and shut down. Right. But that's, uh -huh. there was, there was enough about There's things that I really enjoyed. I'm with you on last Jedi. I think it was a brilliantly written, brilliantly shot. I love what it was trying to say, but the exact things that you said were the same things that I had issue with. The problem is that conversation is, is now lost in this 280 character world that we live in. Yeah, totally. Where it becomes it, hate, love, hate, love. It's like Robert Mitchum in, you know, Night of the Hunter, hate, love, hate, you know? Yeah. And it's it's like, there's a middle ground. I mean, there's, there's a middle ground. And uh, it's just incredible to me that they would have done a trilogy without having a sense of mm -hmm. what the structure, the structure would be. But at, at the same time, it, it's got to be incredibly um, daunting, you know, to have to follow in the footsteps of those movies. And particularly given the fact that the prequels are Oh, for the most part, not beloved. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there is a generation uh, and there is a group that, you know, absolutely adore and think they're the best movies. But so how do you step in and say, OK, we're going to do Star. We're going to go back to the originals and, and, and harken back to that and, you know, bring back everything you loved about Star Wars. You know, was the answer really just retelling Star Wars again after Jedi did the same thing? Probably not. Hmm. But um, but unfortunately, you know, it's so daunting. and you're dealing with a company that's very risk averse, you know, right. so how are we going to get the most, make the most people happy and the least people unhappy? Because you see that in Rise of Skywalker too. There's yeah. like this dramatic um, about face because, okay, we don't want the people that hated Jedi to hate this uh, uh, last Jedi. So we're going to try and, you know, rectify all that stuff and just give them everything they love about Star Wars. Mm. And, you know, obviously that wasn't completely successful in that sense. But, you yeah. know, then look at something like, you know, people, I mean, look, I'm a huge fan of Rogue One. So, mm -hmm. I, I mean, Rogue One to me is up there with my favorite Star Wars movies. And, and like, that's something they completely get right, which sometimes gets falls out of the conversation because everybody's too busy bashing on all the sequels. <laughs> they forget that Rogue One is, you know, a terrific movie. Yeah. Yeah. No, and it's, I mean, and to that end, I think Rogue One works so well because it's, we we started the conversation with it. It's it's rip roaring Star Wars science fiction fantasy action and adventure. I mean that's and and it's a heist movie and it's interesting characters and it's an ensemble and that's why Star Wars worked in the first place. So I, I, I think it surprises you. It kills off. You know, I was shocking when Obi Wan got killed, right? Star Wars when you saw it for the first time. They right. kill off most of the principal cast. Yeah, I mean that's gutsy. Yeah, and I, I, you know, and then at the time. 
you know, Disney isn't happy because it didn't do Force Awakens business and the toy line wasn't successful, which should have come as a shock to no one because how is a kid going to play with characters they saw die in the movie? Right. You know, yeah. um, you know how are you going to have your continuing adventures as a seven-year-old if you know they're dead? Mm-hmm. Um, you're not going to do the prequel. So, um, you know, it's, it's um, you know, they should be thrilled because they, they actually made a really good movie that will stand the test of ta- time. Yeah. That is a true Star Wars prequel in a beautiful way. And um, it's just so, um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's so bizarre. But I'm so fascinated by all these TV shows now. I mean, I'm really looking forward to Andor. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm excited to see what they do. You know, Mandalorian is, it's, 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 I, I've, I've joked about this. I said, it's what $6 million man was to me as a kid, hmm. $6 million man, you know, 20 years from now, I'm not, you know, I, 30 years, I don't look back and say, wow, that was a great show. But when I was a certain age, that was like the greatest show in the world. Super yep. fun. Mm-hmm. And Mandalorian is like, it's super fun. Is it deep? No. Is it, you know, <laughs> is it, is redefining TV? On a technical level, yeah, but on a story level, not really, but it's super fun. Right. I enjoy watching it. Right. You know, that's a nice bar. You know, the fact that it's enjoyable, because so much of TV is so complex and dark and, you know, trying to reinvent the wheel and, you know, and, and, and be socially, um, you know, uh, t- you know and, and, and I just want um, a show that, uh, you know, that can entertain me for 45 minutes, which yeah. it does marvelously. Yeah, and um, and I think you know all these other. Sh- I mean, we are so lucky. I mean, you know what it was like to grow up, you know, after Jedi, like thinking it's yeah. all over, right? Yeah. I mean, it was like all we had was nothing, and then we get Shadows <laughs> of the Empire. We we get into you know Prince Seizure. I was like, okay, a book and a, and a CD and a bunch of action figures <laughs> is not a Star Wars movie. Right now right. we have just nothing but Star Wars, and people are so you know oh this all this star wars stuff sucks but Mm. you know it's like this is horrible and it's like but you know it doesn't have to be for everybody like bad batch there's certain people probably don't like it you know but it's not maybe it's not for you maybe it's not for them you know but it's i i just i don't get the lack of uh you know it's it's frustrating to me uh, because and i've said it before and i it's the the argument i go to all the time is you know, it, I might have a favorite band and I might have loved their first five albums and their sixth album is not what I love. Um, but I'll always have those first five <laughs> albums. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I usually I use Metallica as an example because they okay. hit the way of wool. But yes, Led Zeppelin 100 percent or or whoever. I mean, and so but it's that same kind of concept. And I think what's also might be an issue, too. And we talked about the Internet and is people want to pull more from these than maybe uh, I think star Wars is, is working at multiple levels right now, but trying to do so maybe where it's challenges, you can have your fun rogue one. You can have your fun, <laughs> fun rogue one, seven people get killed at the end of it, but, <laughs> but um, yeah. you can have your Mandalorian, which is, as, as you said, is it brain surgery? No, but is it the most fun you can have once a week? Absolutely. It's a, it's a great show. But once you start to dig into and go to those next levels that's where the arguments tend to happen because that's not the way I imagined Luke Skywalker would go, or that's not the way this would, would happen. Do you think that the internet discourse from a different perspective is making it more difficult for creators? So for example, Sonic the Hedgehog, right? There was all the, the outcry about the way he looked just this past weekend. There were some, some morons who were going after James Mangold about Indiana Jones five, which just literally started shooting. Yeah, is this, I, I think, I think it is harder, and I'll tell you why. But first, I want to address you made a great analogy with you know uh, the, your band analogy because I would say the the problem is after a couple of albums, mm-hmm. all you know you go see them in concert, all you want to hear is the greatest hits. Right. So it's like mm-hmm. you know it's like oh their their later albums suck, so you just want to hear greatest, <laughs> and that's what Disney did. You know, the Force Awakens is the greatest hits album, yep. and it was like oh you know I kind of miss hearing something new. I've heard all these songs, and I kind of want something new. So let you know. Then they give you something new, and you're like, "Oh, I don't like this album. It, 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 I, I want to hear it. it's too. It's too different. Yep. You know. Oh, Luke, Luke is. You know, Luke is bitter, and 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 he's given up the fight, and mm-hmm. you know all this stuff. And it's like, oh, that's not how Luke would be. We want to see him like he is <laughs> in the greatest hits. You know, we want to see him in Jedi with the green lightsaber kicking ass. You know, we, we saw that movie. Yep. You know, <laughs> yep. and, and 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 so it's it's really interesting because uh, you can't please everyone. Yeah. And what happens is it's not the creators that have the problem. It's the studio. And then mm-hmm. the studio wants to please everybody. 
and they they're so worried that Twitter can kill a movie the first weekend. Mm. So then they're leaning on the creators to make sure that they do don't think too outside the box, and it le- leads to really anodyne storytelling because then the studio is really because I mean I heard a rumor and I don't know if it's true that early on Disney had really been pushing JJ to include Darth Vader in. Um, uh, in Force Awakens. And he's mm-hmm. like, you do realize Darth Vader died at the end of Jedi? <laughs> right. You know, like, we'll just get him in. So he comes up with Kylo Ren to be the Darth Vader stand-in. But, mm-hmm. you know, then, you know, it's crazy because Rogue One, you know, is great, super original movie, but what's the thing everybody remembers and loves? And I'm not knocking it because it's awesome. It's Vader <laughs> at the end, you know? Yep. So, you know, there is some truth to that, you know, but it's like we have to create new characters that are just as cool as Darth Vader. They're just as cool as Boba Fett. They're just mm-hmm. as you know, cool as Luke Skywalker, or, you know, so, and and that's the challenge. And sometimes the audience needs time to fall in love with these characters. I mean, you know, it's so funny. Star Wars made the same mistake that Star, Star Trek did, because when Star Trek passed the baton from um, the original cast to the next gen, they said, we really want to focus on the next gen and not do too much with the original. So they just mm-hmm. had Shatner in a you know, medium-sized role, and they barely had the rest of the cast, and Leonard and D passed because... You know, there was nothing for them to do. Had that been a full next generation original series Avengers, mm-hmm. that movie would have been huge and people right. would have loved it. Same thing with Star Wars. Well, we don't want too much of Harrison and too much of Mark and too much of because we really want to introduce these new characters. Mm-hmm. Well, you know what? If you're going to have them, use them and then right. have them leave the stage. But, you know, that's what so I think kills people. You have a movie mm-hmm. where Mark Hamill doesn't show up until his hand shows up at the very end of the movie. <laughs> yep. and, and, you know, and then you, you, you have Harrison, Harrison Ford finally come back when made the most beloved characters of all time to play Han Solo. And what do you do? You know, you have his son kill him and he falls off a bridge for no good reason. Right. It's not even like, you know, a Jedi when he wanted to die, he wanted to die heroically, like saving the universe, right. flying the Millennium Falcon into the Death Star. In, in, in Force Awakens, he literally goes back and stands on a bridge and gets killed by his right. own son. I mean, so it, it just, it's like it, there's nothing redeeming about that death. It's like, so that leaves such a bad taste in, in people's mouths, I think. Yeah. yeah. No, and I, I think, I think you're right. I think it's the, the, challenge becomes, you know, I think the, the best, the best, uh, um, uh, way to save it came from I. I heard from uh, I was interviewing uh, Mike Chen, who is a writer, uh, and he said episode seven, eight, and nine should not have been episode seven, eight, nine. They should have just been the continuing adventures of Star Wars because there was so much weight put on that to continue that story. We would have loved Ray and Kylo and and Finn perhaps differently if we didn't feel like there was the shadow of and the mm. pressure to to control and uh, or to to carry on the story that came before them but uh but either uh, yeah to your point I, I, and i i'll ask i'll ask one last question about the the studio situation a lot of people do say and i've tended to disagree but you brought up an interesting point that disney is the reason why star wars is not what it was right and i'm not going to say better or worse because i actually i love so much of what's out there right now um, is it because Disney is 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 looking at it from that big studio perspective? Is it putting undue pressure or a different pressure uh, on on the creators to make sure they're they're creating something that that is sellable? And does that have that? No, impact? I, I think it would be true at any studio. I think mm-hmm. it's unfair to to label you know that on on Disney they're trying to appeal to the widest possible audience, and that would be true of any studio. I think, you know, people are saying, oh, what would Lucas do? Well, we know what Lucas did. He did the, he did the prequels. And, you know, the, the, thing, the, the thing with Lucas is um, obviously he would be using his own money had he not sold. So right. he also is going to want to do it for as little money as possible to spend mm-hmm. as little money as possible. And, um, you know, it's very hard because, you know, you hear what his plans were for the final trilogy with midichlorians and, mm-hmm. you know, the, and it's just would that have been any better? I don't know. Right. Well, the, I think the you same know. people who were the people versus George Lucas would have ripped that apart. Right. So there, it was, it, it was kind of a no win. And as you said, it's, it's so much of childhood. There's so many intangibles that go mm-hmm. into it. It makes it, it honestly. And, and I've said this before and I'll stick with it. Nothing would have made everybody happy. It's impossible. No, It's impossible. It's absolutely impossible. You know, yeah. people are looking for different stuff and you're absolutely right. There's a certain audience that is looking for nostalgia. And they want to see as much of Han, Leia, 
and 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 Luke as they can, and our and R two who was like missing in action yeah. for the most part. And yeah. then you have a whole new audience who says, "I don't want to see those old fogies. Yep. You know, I want to see the sexy young characters." Mm-hmm. And so it's like, how do you? You know, this what's great about the TV shows. It's like they're making TV shows for everybody. And yeah. somehow with Mandalorian, they seem to hit the sweet spot where it seems like virtually everyone loves it. You yeah. know, but they're going to make shows that are going to work for people like, you know, Andor and Obi-Wan. And, and, and you know, some people are probably not going to like them. Yep. But that's OK, because every couple of weeks it's going to be a new show. <laughs> right. So, right. Who would have thought? Oh, oh my gosh. Yeah, forget. You can imagine if they told, you know, 10 year old you and I that when you're older, there's going to be Star Wars all the time. <laughs> like, am I going to be dead? Is that happen? Right. Is that what happened? Like? You know, it's like, I mean, it's crazy. I mean, somebody told me there would be whatever it is, 12, 13 Star Trek movies. And, right. uh, and, and, and God knows how many shows and all these and Star Wars TV shows. And, and they were going to bring back Battlestar Galactica. Right. I'd be like, you're on glue. You know, <laughs> you know. It's not not po- it's not at all possible. So yeah, it's it's, cra- it's crazy, but it's good. It gives us something to talk about, you know. At the end of the day, and and uh, you know, Star Star Wars, you know, Star Wars isn't going anywhere. And um, you know, I think that uh, the next couple of years will be interesting because it, you know they they clearly know what they're doing when it comes to TV. It'll be interesting to see if they get the movies back on track. It'll be right. very interesting in the wake of. So the the critical bashing that uh, Wonder Woman eighty four got, mm. you know, is this Patty Jenkins film actually going to happen? Is the Takia Watiti film going to happen? Mm. You know, what's Kevin Feige got up his sleeve? You know, it's you know it, they got to do something with these movies. I mean, they've had a couple of swings and misses. You know, first with the the Game of Thrones guys, and then obviously it doesn't seem like this Ryan Johnson thing is happening. That it's quietly going away. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know that for sure, but it just seems like been all quiet on the western front there and you know when he's getting this kind of deal at netflix to do knives out for hundreds of millions of dollars yeah. it's like why would he do star wars why would he put him through that i'll he says i'll get critical love i'll make yeah. a ton of money and i don't have to answer to anybody why <laughs> would he go work for disney to, to get nothing but bashing for 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 from the fans i mean you know he he did he, he got to make a star wars movie why even bother you know i don't blame yeah. him yeah. um so no, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a great point, and it's interesting. And and uh, the, the last question I'll ask you is is where you were headed there is, you know, is Star Wars? I mean, because you have great insight into all kinds of all the the major franchises from from your oral histories and and just from being in the business for as long as you have, is the Star Wars drama around directors and writers and and the, and and all all the things that that gets publicized and picked up, is that the norm, but we just never hear about it. Or is Star Wars a little bit more of a dramatic job to take? As a uh, look, it's true of any big franchise. I mean, I think Star Star Wars is more in the microscope, mm-hmm. and it does happen a little bit more. I mean, obviously, the changes on Solo, and then you know, I I, def- I definitely think you know, Jedi last Jedi spooked them. They tried to do something a little different, and they got hammered. And I think they also, you know, they were expecting all these movies to do force awakens numbers and when Mm -hmm. they didn't you know they really um it it, you know it's it's it scared them Mm -hmm. and so they ran around like you know trying to you know put humpty bump dumpty back together and you (laughs) you get as a result you get you know what happened with solo which i know you know a lot of people like and it's fun but you know it's a glorified tv movie an entertaining Mm -hmm. one but um but it's it's uh i think i think it's 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 really it's really challenging um for them but i i you know and, and in retrospect you kind of think well maybe solo with those guys it would have been interesting to see what they would have done with it mm. you know it would have been it would have been different and the star wars universe is elastic enough it's just maybe that was the wrong movie for them maybe the solo prequel wasn't the right thing to do a tonal shift mm. you know because that we know what han solo is we know what lando is we know what we expect to see in a prequel so if you're going to give Miller and Lord a chance to work in the Star Wars universe. Maybe it should be about a bounty hunter, or maybe it should be about the underworld, or maybe it should be something that we don't have this kind of deep emotional investment and sense of what exactly it's going to be. Right. And then, you know, Colin getting the boot. Um, you know, I think in retrospect, after everything we've seen about Duel of the Fates, it's kind of like, wow, it's kind of disappointing. 
because it, it seems like that could have been really interesting. Yeah. And at least it would have been something we hadn't seen. And it seemed like he really got Star Wars. And, um, you know, and it was surprising because, of course, you know, JJ and, and, and Catherine, Catherine Kennedy didn't, you know, really see eye, eye to eye for a lot of the Force Awakens production. So it's kind of surprising that they came back to JJ. But, you know, there is, it's like hiring, you know, you hire people in this business because they can get the job done. And there are a lot of people, you know, if you haven't proven you can get it done, it's hard to get hired. That's the secret of the business. <laughs> once you've done it once, people want to hire you again because they know you can do it. And it's not something that everyone can do, whether it's a showrunner or a director of a big studio movie. And um, so JJ, they knew, you know, when they, you know, they only had a little bit of time, they knew he could get it done. Mm -hmm. And they knew he could get it done at a certain level of quality. You know, he could, he could develop the script in the time they needed. He could make the movie. He, you know, they knew what they were getting. It was a known quantity. And, um, and so it's risky when you go with someone who hasn't done it before. Mm. Um, because at the end of the day, this is a, it's a business. I mean, it's yeah. why John Favreau gets hired to do Mandalorian. It was a risk that paid off. But, you know, he did Jungle Book. He did, um, you know, be, be, um, um, well, Lion King. Lion King so he yeah. knew how to mm -hmm. work with this technology. And, and so it made sense. Had John Favreau not done those movies, there's no way John Favreau gets hired to right. do uh, Mandalorian. You know, so it's, it's like people want to mitigate risk. People mm -hmm. are very risk averse because people who take on risk, they can be the hero or they can get fired. Mm -hmm. And chances are, you know, when you take a risk in this business, more likely you're going to be the one who gets fired than has mm -hmm. that one in a million success. So um, people don't want to take risks. And so you hire people that you know have done it before or done something similar and can get it done. But as a result, you know, sometimes things aren't imaginative. I mean, look at Star Wars is a perfect lesson. Mm. Here's a guy who has this huge hit and he wants to do something nobody believes in. Nobody understands the script for Star Wars. Nobody mm. thinks it's going to make a dime. But ultimately, Alan, one guy is willing to take the risk. Alan Land is willing to take the risk only because, you know, he trusts. You know, he did this one film that was super successful that he goes, okay, well, if he could do American Graffiti, then I guess whatever this is, <laughs> maybe it'll work. And even then, the board of directors is breathing down his neck, and he has to cut the budget, and the whole time they want to cancel it. And they and they pull the plug on it before he's wrapped, and he has to sneak back and finish the movie. So even then in the 70s, so when we say, oh, Disney, you know, the new age of bean counters, it's always been that right. way. Sure, yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's, <laughs> and I think people need to remember that, right? At the end of the well, day, yeah, exactly. and, if, and if Star Wars doesn't make money, you know what? We don't get more Star Wars. We don't get to live in this this time of, of an embarrassment of riches when it comes to It's the golden age of Star Wars. I don't think waiting every, three years for every, we, you know, we got lucky on Empire, but like, I, 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 if I have my difference of, of like waiting three weeks to see a new Star Wars TV series, and a you know, year between movies or, uh, waiting three years for every new Star Wars movie, I'll take now. Sure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. In a heartbeat, without even thinking about it. So People don't realize what that was like. Three freaking years between yeah. movies. And, you know, it's one thing, you know, you're, you're waiting and you're trying to figure out what Empire is going to be about and who Darth Vader is and what Obi-Wan did, you know, and the dad and all this stuff. And then it blows your mind because, you know, of course, back then, no spoilers. Right. So it's like, and it blows your your mind. And then you wait three years for Jedi, and it's like, oh, he's their sister and brother. Oh, Darth Vader turns good. Hmm. Oh, you know, the teddy bear saved them. It's <laughs> like, and that was three years waiting for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I'd rather, right, if you're not going to love it, I'd rather move on to the next thing more quickly. Uh, <laughs> exactly. and, and and on the other side, if you do love it, you get it so much quicker and better. And and so it is. A, it's an amazing time. So, Mark, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. This was this was fantastic. Where can people uh, find you, and and uh, and where can we get the book? Well, Pete, thank you for asking. First, I want to say, um, still uh, two more weeks on the Kickstarter for 1982 Greatest oh, right. Ever. Yes. So, yep. if people want to support that, they should go to Kickstarter. We're we're uh, doing a deep dive uh, for for the 40th anniversary next year. So, we'll be covering Star Trek Two, and we're going to be covering um, um, uh, Poltergeist and and ET and Blade Runner. And all these amazing movies, and of course obscure stuff like um, 
you know, Forbidden World and Time Rider and Megaforce and Swamp Thing. It's going to be amazing. So they should go to Kickstarter and check out 1982 Greatest Geek Year Ever. The book comes out next month. You can pre-order it wherever you get your books, uh, Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Um, it's going to be in hardcover, audiobook, and, uh, and uh, you know, digital Kindle as well. And, um, uh, you know, I hope people will check that out. I hope they enjoy it. And if they want to follow me on social media, they can go to at Mark A. Altman. Or if they want to follow our podcast, in, at Inglorious Trek. And I'm on Instagram and on um, on Twitter. Awesome. I'll put all those links in the show notes. And uh, Mark, thank you so much. This was a blast. And I, I hope I get to catch up with you again sometime. Well, do I qualify as somebody who knows about Star Wars? Or are you still going to think? Oh, I no. You you know, I, I, I almost feel like you know more about Star Wars and Star Trek. Now, I don't know if I go that far. But you are definitely, you're definitely a Star Wars guy now yeah. in my eyes as well. So, yeah. but uh, well, it's well, fantastic. I have, a, I have a few trivia questions for him. Uh, and- excellent. <laughs> and I, that, blows, that blows my mind oh my god atlantic city that was some <laughs> that was some weekend <laughs> anyway, Pete, it's been a pleasure thanks for having me on the show good to talk to you too thank you very much okay see you take care bye bye